he has the gift of seeing things in a very straightforward way. A great many people who are complicated look at things from a different angle and they get it wrong. Dennis looks, his telescope's pretty straight. No kinks in his telescope. And when he looks down it, he sees exactly what's there and tells you. And I think you are right that being, well, you can say uncomplicated or you can say straightforward. Being as straightforward as he is made the role he had to play easier. All prime ministers, mostly men, but whether they're woman or man, have very low moments. It's a very, it's a very exacting profession. And I've, I've known a few of them well enough to know that they've had very low moments. Moments of profound, great depression, feeling that the hand of politics, you see, is a tremendous pendulum swing. And when the pendulum's against you, it's very lowering. Someone like Dennis would have been invaluable to anyone experiencing the swings of politics. That's why she said, would say that she couldn't do it. Because a wonderfully good consoling manner, wonderfully good consoling, without being silly about it, they often saw further into it than she did, than she did. Would very often say, look, I wouldn't worry about them too much. They won't count in the end, and that would be accurate. They would not count in the end. So in that sense, it was, it is still an ideal match. He was, he really was created for the role of supporting a prime minister through the stormy seas of modern politics. I think he was enormously proud of his wife. It, it wasn't an attitude of, I'm glad I married a woman who was from to such prominence. The pride was, in a sense, quite unselfish, quite unself-centred pride. And there was nothing he wouldn't do while we were travelling abroad, playing golf or doing whatever we were doing. Nothing he wouldn't do to further her interests. I've seen him sign autographs on the back of a boy's knee, um, join balloon dances. You know, people, <clears throat> people are a bit clumsy when they meet celebrities abroad. Um, and um, um, Dennis, of course, recognised wherever we went. People, I thought, often made rather outrageous demands, particularly if we were looking for a, an early evening gin and somebody wanted to stop and talk about his wife and ask for his autograph. But his patience was monumental. He's very moderate with his language on the golf course. He, he's, he can be very explosive on a golf course if a shot doesn't go right. But in the interest of the Prime Minister, he moderated his language very, very strictly on the golf course, certainly within, or within hearing of anybody else. And <clears throat> generally comported himself in a manner which would leave people saying, well, <clears throat> There can't be anything wrong with a Prime Minister who married a man like that. I wouldn't describe him as a shy man. <coughs> shy people are very often very difficult to get on with and not good with strangers. Dennis good with strangers, you know. I'm bad with strangers. I find people who come up to me and suddenly say, I remember you from 15 years ago, ever so slightly tedious. Dennis is frightfully good with them. Ah, oh, really, he says, and gives them his full attention. You've never seen... You've rarely seen Dennis being offhand with a kind of stranger who comes up to him and introduces himself. Now, in that sense, he's not shy. I think we ought just to say in passing what good manners he has. He is well-mannered. He's well-mannered, far better than me. I mean, I'm impatient with strangers. I'm very bad. On a railway train, I'm the typical Englishman. You know, somebody says, uh, I enjoy reading what you write, and I think, oh, God, why do you have to say that now? Dennis was, partly because, of course, of Margaret, Dennis was always forthcoming, responsive, and I only recall one episode. We were 
offered a private jet to fly to Spain, I think it was, and at the last minute they said, would we mind taking on board, he'd sit at the back, out of our way, Paul Daniels, the conjurer, and Danny and I sat in this little private jet and we had a beer and dozed off and suddenly we were woken by this apparition appearing in front of us with a fan of playing cards saying to Dennis, pick a card. <laughs> and the look on Dennis's face was extravagant, extravagant. That's the only time I can think of when he didn't speak in a welcome manner to a stranger. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I always enjoyed him most when he was on about my own profession. The reptiles! That was the best one-liner I can remember. The reptiles of the press. Well, perhaps it was because <laughs> I found it humorous. Perhaps that's why we got on so well. <laughs> Yes, the reptiles. If you're a professional civil servant, you're not really appalled by what you get. Um, you're only appalled by what happens when you've got it. Uh, because after all, this is the decision of the democracy in which you live. Um, I think, bearing in mind the way in which some wives can be overbearing, I didn't worry in the least about Dennis Thatcher being a male consort. Indeed, and as I came to work in the job, I felt that perhaps he better knew his place than some ladies might. And so it was borne out. I don't think Hillary Clinton knew her place, and I have serious doubts as to whether Sherry Blair does. <coughs> it is perfectly clear that Dennis Thatcher did not like journalists and didn't trust them, um, although he boot up with them. Uh, and, of course, he had many drinks with them on the planes, on the VC-10s travelling the world. And the one thing I think that is most interesting about the whole of the 1980s is that they never let him down. I didn't work for him, but I think I'd pretty well, I'd pretty well sussed him out very early on. First of all, he wasn't going to give me trouble. It's a very important thing, very important. Um, um, secondly, he could be relied upon. You could talk to him, and if you wanted him to do something very urgently, then if he saw sense, he would. Um, and thirdly, he was good fun. And I used to sit next to him on <clears throat> many of the tours that we did when there were two tables on either side of the aisle. Um, <clears throat> your mother sat with her back to the pilot. I never understood why she did uh, working there. Dennis sat opposite, having a fag, at appropriate times having a gin, and reading military history as far as I could see. Um, and then we had meals together with the private secretary next to the prime minister and me next to Dennis. And uh, so I think I got to know him. And he was a type, but a type that I could recognize, um, a type that I had experience before, uh, but a bit larger than life than most of them. In the years between 1977 and 1979 when she was elected and I worked for her as leader of the opposition, Dennis Thatcher's presence, as it were, was rather like the Marquis of Carabas in Puss in Boots. He was never seen. He may have come in, for all I know, he may have seen her, but he never made tours of the office, he didn't speak to the staff. On the other hand, everybody liked what they knew about him. She spoke of him often. He had to be accommodated in arrangements that were made for her, but he was never seen. I think if you want a measure of how stunningly successful Dennis Thatcher was uh, as a consort, then it lies in the list of a thousand appalling things that could have gone wrong, terrible things that he could have said, uh, feet that could have been put out of place, terrible blunders that he could have made at dinner parties or, or in public. Every day uh, for a, a consort come new political eggs on which to tread and he trod on all those eggs day after day and almost never broke one of them. So there will be no monument to him because there wasn't anything that he did. But there are a hell of a lot of things he didn't do, thank goodness. 
It's going to sound rather soppy to say this, but I thought, and all of us who worked in her office and later who were members of parliament for her thought, that his big input was emotional. He was somebody who loved her. And not a lot of people actually did love Margaret Thatcher. Lots of people worshipped her. Lots of people feared her. Lots of us admired her. Uh, but Dennis, and almost only Dennis, her own father being dead, Dennis obviously loved her. And we all thought that this was terrifically important, I think critical, crucial to her, and, and she gave that impression too. I think that without the unconditional support and love of, of somebody, and, and without the, the cushion against loneliness that, that such a person can provide, political life could be so bleak as, as to be almost impossible, and I, I can think of a number of politicians who have lacked that support and, and, and who have collapsed in one way or another. Margaret Thatcher is an immensely strong person, but however strong you are, uh, unless you have somebody to go home to who, who loves you, um, you're finished. I mustn't pretend uh, t to have any window into either of their souls or their marriage, but, but I think that Dennis Thatcher saw Margaret Thatcher as his last great project in life. Having been very successful in business, uh, he undertook another project, and it was her and her political career, her prime ministership. He backed it. He backed it financially, much more important. He backed it emotionally. He backed it in all sorts of practical ways. And then he backed it with his own labour as her consort for years and years and years. And I don't think he just saw himself as some kind of accessory or accomplice to that. It was, in one sense, his project.